David Johnson, thanks for joining me in Perth for Lessons on Leadership. It's great to have you here, Peter. David, it's a joy to be able to talk to you and, and speak to our four West Australian uh, Defence Ministers, so which I'll be doing over the next few days. Tell me, um, how did you find yourself in the job? Were you expecting it? What was the story of how you got to Defence? Well, it goes back to the time of Federation. John Forrest put us into the Federation in 1899. He did so for defence reasons. And so Kim Beasley, Julie Bishop, Stephen Smith, Linda Reynolds, myself, uh, Melissa Price, have all had a focus not on health or education, which we'd like to think we want to do ourselves over here in the West. Um, it's all about uh, humanities such as defence and foreign affairs. And that has been a Western Australian focus for most of our senior federal politicians. So you think there's a distinctively West Australian style to being a Minister for Defence? Well, you know, we've got uh, about 2.8 million square kilometres in the West. We've got a trillion dollars worth of investment in oil and gas and minerals off the northwest shelf. And uh, we think that's w well worth defending mm. and, and well worth the investment of, of the eastern states in a defence force that able to have really competent ISR to see what's going on in our, on our frontier, particularly the maritime frontier. So you had been um, shadow minister for a number of years Five, before yep. the Abbott government got itself elected. You would obviously read yourself into the portfolio and was expecting to become yep. minister. Was there anything that surprised you about the reality of being minister once you'd actually gotten into the job compared to what you were expecting? Well, in opposition, this is the joys of our democratic system, which is a very good one, I'd like to think. Um, for five years, I could travel all over Australia at taxpayers' expense talking to constituents, that is, both uniforms and industry players. And accordingly, for five years, I, I virtually had a university degree in what was happening mm. underneath the surface of the defence portfolio because um, I was the opposition spokesperson and, um, you know, you, I, I was completely immersed in it. And even to this day, I, I carry a lot of the things I learned. Industry particularly took me under its wing and said, here's what we are doing and here's why. And here's how we are interoperable with the United States. But beyond that, we're interchangeable. Mm, mm, mm. And so, you know, I was, I was pretty lucky like that. That so, offended some people, I should say. Did, did you have an agenda, David, for what you wanted well, to reform, do? Well, I'm a reformer, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I acknowledge that ministers, particularly in this portfolio, are ships in the night, and that you need to get things done really fast. And so the first principles review was something that I saw as being, and, and from an early stage in the five years in opposition, I, I thought we've got to do a lot of reform. Not so much in the uniforms command and control side, that's their business and they're very good at it. But in the acquisition side, mm. there was, over the period, I, I'd been a senator for, say, 10 years at that point, a lot of project management, which we take for granted here in Western Australia. You know, we build big, you know, $50, $60 billion projects all the time with some hiccups, mm. but usually they roll out reasonably uh, well. Whereas in defence, there had been a litany of long projects that were causing problems. They weren't 50 and 60 billion, but they were three and four billion dollar project. Wedgetar is a classic example, which is now one of our best capabilities. But for a long time, that was really a big problem. Yeah. And so I was very keen that we would reform the commercial side of the department. We'll come to some of those big procurement issues that you dealt with uh, during your time, but but I'm still around some of the preliminaries about sure. how you uh, kind of established yourself in the portfolio. Defence is known for having a particularly high workload. And of course, as a West Australian, you have the added increment of all the travel that you have to do back and forth to Canberra all the time. How did, how did you find the workload? What was that experience like for you? Well, the workload in opposition is virtually minimal. So yeah. Senate estimates four times a year was my, was my big gig. And so I'd take two weeks to prepare for each Senate estimates, which you know was one or two days for defence. And that was all I did. So I was lucky like that. Mm -hmm. And I had good people advising me. So there's a whole lot of reliable people come out of the woodwork to say, do you know? Mm -hmm. And if you give them the time of day, and I did that. So in my office in Canberra, in, in Parliament House, there was 
a parade of people coming through. And that's one of the points of massive difference. When you're a minister, you don't see anybody. Because, minister, this is about probity. Yeah. yeah. And you're not allowed to see any of these people. Mm. So the minister is actually, to some extent, flying blind. Whereas in opposition, everybody tells you what's happening. That's interesting. Did you find it being um, isolating in some oh, way? Oh, very isolating and extremely frustrating because yeah. your one conduit of information, which is heavily controlled, is the department. Now, rightly or wrongly, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit of a renegade out there talking to people privately. Well, I'd go to a function and, and I know that they were watching me talking to senior contractors and, and even senior officers who would very quietly say to me, we need to do this with Plan Bersheba. And I go, well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the relationship you established with the Secretary and the CDF. That's the, the diarchy that runs defence. It's pretty crucial to how a minister engages with us. Well, my relationship with the CDFs were, I'd like to think, very good. Even today, I believe I could knock on the Governor-General's door and uh, we could sit down and have a drink and, uh, and, and chew the fat. Uh, he and his wife, lovely people. Uh, um, Mark Binscombe, absolutely delightful. Uh, fellow with Gita, we did so many things around Australia and internationally together. So that the uniforms, I've always been an admirer and they know that. They knew that I was a fan because they had committed themselves to service of our country. And, you know, this portfolio is the only one that legitimately delivers lethal force. Mm -hmm. And accordingly, um, they deserve a huge amount of respect for that trust. Uh, and that capability. So the uniform's not a problem. The department is a different kettle of fish. Now, I had a secretary who was par excellence, a very senior, experienced man who was invaluable in a National Security Committee meeting. Dennis Richardson is probably one of the truly great secretaries of any department that this, this country has ever seen. He has a very firm view of certain things, some of which I didn't agree with. So we would have our moments and we would have our arguments, but they, I think they were all very respectful. Um, but he, he's seriously a very smart operator and I, and I had enormous respect for him, even though we disagreed on some matters. A tough secretary, not one to suffer fools gladly. Well, he saw the big picture very well because he'd been the ambassador and, uh, and John Howard made him the ambassador in the US, which is our, probably our most important national security placement. Mm. And so I, I was very respectful, and he'd run ASIO. He knew um, where the bodies were buried. <laughs> and um, so I, he, every now and then he'd give me really good advice. But, you know, he, he wanted a big department. Mm. The, 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 the guys in Canberra want to have lots of people. And that's contrary to my view of where we should be in the world. Um, small, lean, mean. Yes. And I looked at countries like South Korea um, and Japan and others. The public service is in, in, in the ones, twos, threes of thousands. We had 23,000 public servants running about 55,000 uniforms when I, when I came in. And I thought that was a bit, a bit too much. So um, first principles review was the review of the, uh, how the department ran and managed itself. And, and over your time as minister, perhaps a little bit longer, uh, that 23,000 defence civilians went down to about 17 or 18,000. Correct. Correct. Do you think that was the right thing looking back in retrospect? To... Well, no one said to me, gee, we're missing a lot of people. <laughs> no one said to me, there's an issue with personnel. Yes. Um, I think... That that's 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 Canberra, and I think a lot of ministers could achieve, maybe not so much, but some substantial reductions in the workforce. We didn't pay any redundancies. These were these were just we. I don't mind doing contracts, mm. because when you do a contract, you actually control things a lot better than you do with employees. Um, you know, you just don't renew the contract. Yes, it's yes. that simple. And and I'm hugely believing in that. The department needs to go out and get contracts for people to do things, particularly in the acquisition space. You know that one of my huge bugbears was ASC and the department being the customer. 
with the taxpayer having no remedy. Mm. So if if the product that with the ships were no good and we had some issues, the de- the defence department was effectively suing the finance department yeah. because the finance department owned ASC. Now that to me is just wrong. The Americans don't do that, and that's our model. So when a submarine is built, you know, by electric boat in Grocon, there is a contract and the Pentagon has a remedy, a private commercial, proper commercial remedy with liquidated damages, etc. Well, we weren't in that space. And for the life of me, to this day, um, I still don't understand why the Americans can do it, but we always say, oh, we want to own ASC. Well, I just think that's ridiculous, but that's just me from Western Australia. So there was the historical legacy of the government of the day owning the, the submarine corporation, which was a critical bit. All of, governments of yeah, the day. Yes, yes. Well, we, you know, Kim Beasley got ASC going and yeah. purchased the shares that owned the thing back in the, uh, in the late 80s. Should Early 90s. the government of which you were a part have bitten the bullet and commercialised that out? Oh, totally. And I was, you know, I was a lone voice for that. Yes. I wanted to see that ASC was sold because we had many offers on the table. Many um, large, reliable, trustworthy corporations that we could have, and we're doing it with submarines right now. You know, we can insulate the, the secrecy side of things very well. We've done it on almost every project. Now, you know, we could have done it on, on, uh, with ASC and ships. And uh, I just see no reason why the government should, should have no... What happens is ASC fundamentally has no skin in the game. Mm, mm. Well, let's talk submarines, David. I mean, you, sure. you were, uh, inherited a legacy whereby Labor in office for six years or so had not made any definitive decisions about the future submarine. And so you would have known from pretty early on that that was going to be one of the big decisions that, you know, the Abbott-Turnbull government would, would have to make in its time. What was your early thinking about how to approach that challenge? Well, first of all, the main thing that I thought was crucial, rightly or wrongly, was the avoidance of a capability gap, because we'd had one. Mm. 2010, we had mm. no boats in the water. So that if you have a belief that the, 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 the Cockham's design um, Collins class at 3,200 submerged tonnes is a viable operational attack class submarine, albeit conventionally powered, then we had to make sure that it was serviced appropriately. And Robert Hill put the money on the table for ASC to do that, but there had been a shortfall in, in crewing and a shortfall in maintenance. So the first task was to avoid and to get the thing back going, which, which, which Labor did to some extent, uh, and estimates will prove me out in that to a degree, but to get the thing back to square one, bring some skippers back who had left the Navy without penalty, to do all the sorts of things that got that force element group back up and running and imparted some confidence in the crews. I think we did that um, because I had great faith and I'd been to several RIMPACs. And when I, when I go to a RIMPAC, I don't just go there for a holiday in Hawaii. I was actually talking to people and, and sub, submarine crews would be very nervous when I came on board because I'd be talking shop. How did you go? What did you do? How did we do against that task, that task group? Did we get in underneath? What, did, what happened? And accordingly, I knew that the Americans had employed a Gotland-class submarine because Collins had, and it was Deshano or Walla, one of the two, had done really good work in a couple of exercises. And the Americans were used to a cooler and delta class and accordingly loud, noisy, fast-moving submarines. At four knots, I think Collins is virtually undetectable. And accordingly, the Americans were, were not used to that type of capability. Yes. Notwithstanding, many of our potential adversaries have diesel electric submarines. So they got that Gotland class off San Diego for a, for a lot of practice. For two years, they worked with it. And that's down to our capability. Mm. Now, I, I think that's a really big tick for us. So ultimately, um, the submarines were very, very much at the forefront of my consideration. It's, and Kim Beasley said this, and I agree with him. After the Lucas Heights reactor, it's our most technically scientific artefact. You know, you've got 52 people under the water at 200 metres. I mean, it's a huge responsibility for the government. And, uh, 
you know, I, I just think that it soaks up a, a billion dollars a year, uh, roughly, in costs, uh, which creates some resentment, both in the wider department and in Navy. But as a deterrent, you put one of those in Sunda, Lombok or Malacca and everybody's going. Because I've seen it on frigates. Mm. Everyone goes, there's a submarine here somewhere. Mm. It's a panic station. A, cr a critical bit of technology. And I think inside the system, if not in the wider country, there was an understanding that Collins was probably the best conventional submarine in the world. You know, by the time, you know, the government, you, you were minister in the government. That's right. I used to say to Kim Beasley, we've got a lot of problems with Collins. But I, and we did, they were technical maintenance issue problems. Yes, yes. But the actual submarine is a very, very good one. Submarine. The problem we have is that submariners love to hear bad things about their platform. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious about this yes. because they want potential adversaries to think that it's a lemon. It is very capable. And if you lift the lid on what it's done, it's a very good submarine. They're, but they're, I, I don't want to say any more than that. They're certainly not good at talking up their capability, David. But, of course, the other big challenge was um, finding the eventual Collins replacement. Sure. Now, the interesting um, story about the Abbott government is that it started in one place thinking about uh, defence capabilities and then it ended up in quite a different one. Tony Abbott began as Prime Minister by really thinking about can we buy a Collins replacement submarine offshore? And of course, it's widely known that the Japanese Soru class was the one that he was most um, directly thinking of and the relationship that he'd built. As was Shinzo I. Abe. As was I. So tell me about that story. How did we move from this is the obvious offshore sure. selection to a design competition that just a little bit after you led to the outcome sure. of the, the French uh, short fin barracuda being So selected. first of all, you have to understand what we do with a submarine. Now, our submarine lives in the four, top 40 metres of equatorial water, which is hot, so that sonar does not get through that dense hot water. Now, that's not something that the Japanese do. It's not necessarily something the Germans do. It's partially something the French understand, but partially, because they've sold diesel electric submarines to the Malaysians. So once you understand where we are at with the operations of a submarine, you know that we don't go very deep, but we do have to traverse an enormous distance to get into an operational mode. So size, fuel, batteries, motors, very, very important to us. And to carry the load of, and, and, and a Collins can carry 28 weapons with tubes loaded from memory. Now, I like the Soryu because it's uh, just on 4,000 submerged tonnes. Move, the physics of moving that mass through the water, I thought, this is very impressive. But when I, I went there, as did my chief of staff, who was a submariner, as did DST, as did the secretary, we realised that the, that the con ops for that sub is completely diverse from what we, we want from a submarine. And mm. its range was not that good. Mm. Very good submarine, Marseille. Double hull, three decked. Uh, really good motors. The Kawasaki motors are highly professional, highly efficient. Um, great vessel, made of a, a substance that is super high tensile, very resilient, shockproof submarine. Very, very good submarine, but not what we want. Right. So we wanted someone who understood the hydrodynamics of moving more than 4,000 tonnes through the water with fuel, weapons, batteries, engines. The Reynolds numbers of the hydrodynamics of the hull were, were the crucial things. The French have a 14,000 tonne inter intercontinental ballistic missile carrier, the La Triomphant class. They have a, a, and a, have just completed the first, I think, of their attack class, 7,500 tonnes, the Barracuda. And they have a diesel electric submarine of 2,000 tonnes, the Scorpion. Now, that said to me that they understood the physics of moving things at reasonable depth through the water. Uh, the Germans had never built anything bigger than 2,000 tonnes, two and a half maybe. So there we were, three competitors, one of which was very diversely skilled in understanding the basic physics of moving masses through water. Uh, I don't think there was much of a comp competition. But to get to that point, the party room had some issues. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister was upset that his numbers weren't as good as they could be. He needed the South Australians. He promised them a competition. And it was a competition that the Japanese were never going to win. 
there was a lot of resistance from inside Japan, may I say, without going into too much detail. Um, we needed excess capacity in Japan. So, see, a military off-the-shelf submarine is, is completely mythological. And, and I, I love people saying this even now in the yes. Australian. You read certain journalists saying, we need to buy something military off the shelf. Even nuclear is mythological for us because we have no nuclear capability whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so long story short, the French won. Now, the French have the capacity. And the, the argument between us and the French is foreground and background IP. Now, we will teach the French an enormous amount of things and we'll insulate them from the combat management system, which we, which we do on so many fronts. Collins has an A and BYG one, which is the same as Virginia and Los Angeles. So we are interoperable and interchangeable with the United States. We have 59,000 uniforms. In one base in North Carolina, there's 150,000 soldiers. One task group, of which there are 11, has more firepower and more squadrons than the whole of our defence force. Uh -huh. So let's get our context right. Yeah. So we will bolt on like we did in World War II to what, you know, in a serious conflict, we will bolt on to the Americans as, we, as we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan. Did, did the, um, the fact that we were talking about a French submarine design give you uh, pause for concern about what that would mean for the US relationship and putting their combat system on a, a French vessel? No, because the Americans knew that our diesel electric submarine capability was something they leveraged off. So that if we had an even better, more agile, more flexible, more long range submarine, they would be principally one of the beneficiaries. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yes, yes, there was an issue with the French, but I think that's dissipated. And yes, it's costing us money to insulate the secret elements of the project, but we do, we're going to do it. Every, every country does it. I mean, you know, there are very few countries, save for the, the, the big one, USA, that does everything on its own. And BAE does a lot of work for them, yep. yeah. which is a foreign-owned contractor. Indeed. So bottom line is I think the Americans are watching, they're participating, they're involved in the management of that project. And I think that they're saying things back to the Pentagon that are positive, and we will have a very, very good submarine that has enormously more capability than Collins has now, particularly for special forces and particularly for range, speed, endurance, etc. Let's go to strategy, David. Um, you began uh, in the early stage of 2014, what ultimately was released in February 2016 as yep. a defence white paper. Yep. Uh, I should declare an interest. You asked me to be your uh, senior external advisor right. for, uh, and you for, the, for the purposes of doing that paper. And my memory of it is pretty complex exercise. We had a we had a public consultation. We had discussion papers. We had about ten or twelve visits to the National Security Committee of Cabinet. To, to, Was this right. all just simply too complicated for what Australia actually needed? Were you comfortable with how this process unfolded? Well, I was because one of the principal litmus tests is all of the other secretaries. If we were going to achieve two percent of GDP, which we have which is old news now. Mm. The next question is, what's the next budget? Because yeah. defence must have that step out over the four, beyond the four budget out years. But come back to the point. The secretaries, there's an enormous amount of jealousy as to, as to budgets. Um, the 50,000 people on 800 boats had taught us a very severe lesson in around about 2010, 2011. Our ISR capability was not good. We then did things, Prime Minister Abbott did things that were quite unique and innovative that solved the problem. And we leveraged off that new knowledge to say the Defence Force and Border Force must have substantial budgets. So the white paper, the first consideration for the white paper was page 181, the step up to 2%, yeah. the money. And as Sir Arthur Tang said, Strategy without money is not strategy. And I live and die by exactly that. If you are going to be in this business, if we're going to have a defence force, we've got to pay for it. It's, it's, it's like being pregnant. Yep. You either are or you're not. Right? And we are. And we have an alliance where we need to shoulder some burden, where we need to step up from time to time, and we need to have the comfort and confidence of our partner. Because it is a, it is, the United States is our partner. 
Pine Gap, Darwin, a whole host of other facilities, we are in partnership with them. Sadly, well, rightly or wrongly, a line across California at Bakersfield, we are everything south of that in one state. 25 million, 26 million people. I have to tell Americans that. Mm. They, you know, they, they ogle it at that reality. I said, we are a very small country mm. with the same, roughly the same land mass you've got. But our, our maritime frontier of 10 million square kilometres is something that requires technology and an alliance. Yes. Yes. So that's the context that I went into the portfolio with. The other side of that strategy coin is, of course, China. And um, it's, it's coincidental but noteworthy, uh, David, that uh, at about the time the Defence White Paper started in February of 2014, that was about the time China started its construction of the three island yep. facilities in the South China Sea. And at about the time the white paper was completed in February of 16, that was about the time that China completed its island construction in the South China Sea. What, what's your thinking of how Australia has to deal with this more aggressive and assertive China? And of course, in asking you this, I'm also conscious that you, you are a West Australian. West Australia exports a huge quantity of Australia's uh, wealth to China in the form of iron ore and other, sure. other materials. How do we, how do we man manage that complexity? Well, firstly, I don't think we get upset or a little bit too uh, pedantic about Chinese spying. I think it's in their nature. That's what they do. Um, and, you know, when someone says, oh, we should never have sold a port to them. Well, what difference? does ownership make, save for the money, because we're a free country. You can drive around, you can park behind the fence, you can stand up on the top of the roof of the car and you take as many photos as you like and you look like a tourist. And we don't bat an eyelid about that. Now, yes, the Marines will come to Darwin in a separate area that is secure, where if someone is taking photos, we will switch onto that. But satellite technology means that they can watch. Everything we're doing, we watch what they're doing. So let's not get too uptight about some of these things. The cyber stuff is different, and I draw a line under that. That is, that is very provocative and bordering on acts of war, mm -hmm. in my humble opinion. But in Western Australia, we walk a very fine line so that Chinese companies, be they state-owned or, or privately owned, own equity in a lot of mines, equity in oil and gas. They own... Uh, ports, port facilities. They participate in joint ventures right around Western Australia where they have equity. They own private and commercial land, farms, sheep stations, pastoral leases, what have you. We manage that reasonably well. We have a Chinese consul here in Perth. We engage her on a regular basis. It might be a he now because I think she's been ill and has just gone back home. But we are used to managing that. Similarly, we have a Japanese consul. We have a US consul. So Chevron, Mobil, Exxon, etc. we deal with them equally uh, from a Western Australian point of view. Um, we deal with Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Kawasaki, um, Komatsu, etc. Uh, Tokyo Electric with the Japanese. We are very commercially focused here and we keep the politics to one side, to the margin. Now, that's a bit of a luxury we may not be able to afford going forward, given recent events. But I think we manage that as a little bit of an example as to how not to get too uptight about certain things that don't really matter. Yes. Certain things do matter. And we need to, and we were, even in my day, talking to the Chinese about cyber and saying, this is not on. You know, the Padong facility is, is not um, you know, to do what it's doing. I mean, I, I was in Parliament when we had a, an attack. And, I, and, and, and we, the reason we could tell it was China was because all the members of Parliament that were interested in Falun Gong and other things were the ones that were <laughs> hit. <laughs> it was obvious. <laughs> so it was a political thing. Yes. So, and and, and you know, when you're away from Perth, you have to do all your banking online. Yeah. And none of that was affected. Yeah. So there was no criminal intent. It was political. It was political. And, and accordingly, you know, I just think that we need to sit down with them more and say, look, you want to be part of the world community. Well, don't be, don't be so paranoid. 
Christopher Pine uh, recently gave a speech, uh, I think he was receiving an honorary doctorate, uh, David, from, uh, from Adelaide University, saying uh, we could find ourselves or the world could find itself in a conflict with China. He said in a five to ten year period. Did you agree with that assessment? Well, I always thought that Hong Kong would be the model that might have succeeded in getting the Taiwanese to rejoin mainland China. But of course, that has evaporated, and that is now in, that concept is in flames. Yes, it's gone in the opposite direction. It's totally the opposite direction, yeah. which I'm very unhappy about yeah. because uh, I've been to Hong Kong so many times I can't can't recall. And Hong Kong is a democratically based. They're, they're used to voting, whereas if you go to Shanghai or Beijing, no one no one knocks you on the taps you on the shoulder and says we want to vote. Mm. No one says that. They, 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 you know, they, they've got ten generations of no voting. Taiwan, I've been there for two Taiwanese elections. They are immersed in democracy. It's a very cut and thrust democracy, I yeah, might say. Yeah. But the point is, um, both of those nuts are going to be very difficult for Beijing to crack. And I think Hong Kong is going to prove to be a real problem for them going forward. Taiwan will be an enormous problem for them. I think they need to, we need to realise that there are two sides to the political argument in Taiwan. One is a little bit more malleable with Beijing, the KMT. The other side is very independent and wants to run plebiscites and, 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 and have um, all manner of um, political discussion about independence, which, which aggravates Beijing. Mm -hmm. As time goes by, it's going to be up to a joint exercise from Beijing and Taiwan to cool the temperature across the strait. Now, I think that's doable. And I think the status quo can prevail, notwithstanding the rhetoric. But um, us sticking our beak in, the Americans sticking their nose in, I think is potentially problematic. Leave it to the Taiwanese to do. Taiwan has built most of Shanghai. You know, the, the, uh, the opposite side of the bank is, is all those beautiful buildings are all funded very much like, very much from Taiwanese investment. And on, on you know, Chinese New Year, there's massive numbers of people coming and going. And China has allowed tourists into Taipei for a long, long time now. Yes. Uh, so I'm just careful that we don't um, put our foot into the, into the thing the wrong way. Mm. We need to be supportive of Taiwan. Uh, we need to encourage them and, and provide them with as much comfort as we can without being provocative to Beijing. It's a fine line. Let's talk about your role as a defence minister in that international environment. I, I, I know that uh, personally you've been close to Japan for many years, yep. used to be a frequent visitor there. Um, how did you find the business of engaging, say, for example, with your Japanese counterparts? We now have a quad which is emerging, and, and frankly, the, the core of that is a very close Australia-Japan-US trilateral relationship. Uh, what was your approach to this type of defence diplomacy, if we call it that? Well, you have to be Western Australian to some extent to understand what we've achieved with Japan. So Charles Court back in the 60s had to fund Woodside getting off the ground. And so the state government had to do a take or pay agreement for the gas, for the LNG. Massive red numbers in the state government's balance sheet as a liability. Hmm. And, and subsequent Labor premiers talk about it now. They said we were looking at a lot of money. Mm. The saviour was Japan. Mm. Now, as a bit of background, Sir Charles Court took the surrender on Bougainville from two colonels in 1945. Mm. They became his lifelong friends and would stay with him in Netherlands and he would stay with them in Tokyo. So the Japanese came down here in the 60s and 70s and took on average 10 to 20% equity. They were extremely honourable. And... Hammersley Iron, um, Mount Newman Mining, um, Woodside, Mitsui have all been built on a relationship with Japan that has been most successful for not just Western Australia, but for Australia. So that's what I say when I'm talking publicly in Japan. Mm. Thank you for building the, the, the commercial standing of my home state of Western Australia. And we love to see your lights burning because it's our LNG. <laughs> And my I say, cents per kilowatt hour in Tokyo is much cheaper than it is in Australia. <laughs> Funnily enough, it's a bit sad. I'm, yes. I'm a bit annoyed about that, yeah. but nevertheless. Um, so Japan is a very, very good friend of ours here in the West, 
and more broadly, tourism when it was really flying along in Queensland, New South Wales, Canberra, etc., and Phillip Island. In um, you know, the Japanese are very particular about which places they go. Yapoon, Phillip Island, and Sydney mm. are, the, are the three, and sometimes the Gold Coast is where they go for holidays. And we we've done very well out of Japanese tourism. Um, so, more broadly speaking. The defence relationship is a, is a very strong one. As the Australian defence industry export advocate, I spend a fair bit of my time telling the Japanese that we are interoperable and interchangeable with the USA, but no ITARs and no FMS. And even the Americans know, he have heard me say that. Yes, yes. And hence Boeing is building loyal wingman in Australia yes. for that reason. So, so Japanese relationship, very good. I speak skushidake a little bit of Japanese, um, spend about two years of my life in Japan all up, and I should speak a lot more than I do, but the relationship with Japan and defence ministers in Japan has been very, very good. It's fascinating, Dave. Let's talk um, defence exports a little bit because uh, this has also been part of your life in, in, in recent years. Um, I think it's pretty clear that the, the industrial design that we want to have for defence industry in Australia actually relies on us becoming a successful defence industry exporter as well. And, and you and subsequent ministers have recognised that. But it's not an easy business, is it? I mean, we have a number of highly competitive countries Correct. that we are, we are competing with. Well, like us, you have to put yourself in the shoes of a potential per purchaser. They don't want a transaction. They want a partnership. Mm. So... Not only can we sell them things, but we can partner with them in the development of those things. And accordingly, the Middle East is a classic example. The five eyes are a given, right? We, and, and there's a number of products that we have that the five eyes want and use and we sell to them. Yes. But Japan, India, the Middle East, and some of our neighbours, our nearer neighbours, it's a different thing. So for Indonesia, I, shall, I, I sell sustainment. Their, 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 their engineering skills need improvement and, and, you know, we have a number of companies working in Indonesia maintaining their equipment. Um, so bold, more broadly, um, the approach is one of partnership, not a transaction, because they want to have the capability, as we do, of building and doing things themselves just like with the French with us on submarines, right? It's exactly the reverse case. So we want to show them how to do software, sustainment, um, stabilise remote weapon stations, those sorts of things we will sh sell them, but it will be a package that they are engaged in so that we give them not just the product, we give them the capability and the sustainment of that capability. Mm. That's an understanding that I think cuts the mustard internationally for us. A lot of the uh, our competitors don't do that. Are you confident that we can achieve the sort of niche place for ourselves that um, subsequent ministers to you, uh, Christopher Pine, wanted yep, us to sure. become a top 10 exporter? Well, look, it's very hard to measure. Yep. That's the first thing. And, and I spend a lot of time with the department talking about benchmarks. Right. One of the benchmarks that we have is how many applications to the Defence Trade Control section of Defence, which is a quasi-judicial body, how many applications are made and how many are approved. Um, we're still working on that data, but I can tell you that it is in the last three or four years has literally increased hundreds of percentage points. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So we are doing, albeit little things. So, so give you an example. On the back of every US Navy ship is a counter UAV module. That came from Melbourne. So when an Iranian UAV was shot down in the Gulf, it was our system that did that. And it's on every ship, right. every Navy ship. Mm. Uh, and I'm very proud of what we've achieved there. Um, there's a whole host of things that we do. Um, low noise oscillators in Raytheon radars came from Fremantle, mm. came from the University of Western Australia. And that's a long story, but it's a, it's a fascinating story. So, so we do unique specialist things that are restricted to the five eyes by and large. Some of them are even restricted beyond that. But they're out there and, and I always say to my 30 or 40 
business people that we take to Euronaval, to DSCI in London and Japan, to uh, AUSA in, in Washington. I say, what's your wow factor? Now, a lot of our businesses tell me stuff that isn't the wow factor. Mm -hmm. My task is to get their pitch right because I'd like to think I have a reasonable understanding of what a foreign military is going to be interested in. Yes. Yeah. And, and I have a better than most, as a, as a slightly educated amateur, better than most understanding of what is going to push their buttons. Mm. So I coach the guys up, guys and girls, up to being able to say to an admiral that pops by, this vehicle is has an auxiliary motor that gives it a portable command and control function. That's Hawkeye. And a lot of the Middle Eastern people love that because it gives them a portability of command and control with all of the data at their fingertips and you can drive it around. Right. Right. It's wonderful. Mm. It's a very clever piece of kit. And I sell that. Well, I try to. They, they sell it. I just support them. Right, right. Uh, David, in the time we've got left, I wanted to touch on uh, operations uh, during your time as Minister and then uh, some of the highs and lows of the job. Sure. Um, operations. Uh, so in your time, um, Afghanistan largely winding down to a training function. But uh, we have, of course, the rise of IS and a very significant Australian role, both in terms of mentoring and assisting the Iraqi forces uh, as they position towards uh, retaking Mosul eventually. And we have the air campaign, which included not only Iraq, but also Syria in due course. Um, as minister for sort of the early uh, phases of that, uh, how did you approach your role? Were you concerned, for example, about the risk to uh, the ADF of casualties? How, how does government actually think about these types of difficult operations? Well, the first thing that I think a minister has to do is when he's not a minister, go to funerals. We lost 41 in Afghanistan. Mm. I went to about 26 funerals. Saw the families, the mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, wives, girlfriends, etc. And then you understand that the application of lethal force and the exposure of men and women to risk has a price. Mm. Now, moving that to one side, at Bungendore we have a very, very unique facility that is quite outstanding and I think it's probably up there as one of the most skilled risk assessment strategic planning general headquarters in the world and I grew to rely on everything so when they, I saw a file from them I knew to read it very very carefully to digest it because lots of man hours would have gone into its preparation things that are important, were important to me. When we're dropping munitions on targets that are not necessarily always going to be uh, military targets, we have to have rules of engagement that are very, very strict. So we have and have always had, to the best of my knowledge, a non-combatant value when we're launching a weapon from an aircraft of zero so that we pre-detonate, we divert if a civilian is in the blast radius of the target. Uh, that's a very important function for our integrity and our esteem as, as, a, as, as a country, because I think as a country we have a lot of um, um, pride in us doing things correctly and lawfully. So as a lawyer, I was very keen that we would apply lethal force lawfully. So United Nations um, resolutions, etc., etc., very, very important. They're a detail, they're often an inconvenient detail, but they're crucial. Mm. So if you stick to those bottom lines, we can go forward in comfort. And yes, we deploy a lot of lawyers to El Minhad and El Defour, right? To review what's gone on, to make sure that we're compliant with yes. the law, the international law. Um, broadly speaking, we have one of the most professional, highly trained group of, of leadership officers that a politician should leave to their own devices by and large. There are certain times that politicians should get involved. But these people, these men and women know what they're doing. Their whole life has been spent understanding what 
the business end of what they do professionally has to deliver. They're very good at it. Mm. And I'm very proud to have been, albeit for a short time, their minister. Um, Bungendore, I think, is, is probably the bottom line of how good we really are. And having been to Bungendore on several occasions to see and, and, and been shown exactly the, the mechanics of what we go through to deliver, not just lethality, but humanitarian and disaster relief. Mm. We put people into places that have been devastated, but we know what we're going to because of Bungendore. It's very, very good. David, to finish up, you've already mentioned that uh, the experience of being Defence Minister is a little bit like a ship that passes in the night, sure. it comes and goes. You left in a fairly stormy way, sure. having had some fairly um, noisy public fights with ASC. Um, you, you, yep. you doubted their ability to construct a canoe at some Correct. stage. How do you uh, look back on that time and... The, the business of just struggling to stay on as minister and to sort of manage these complex, very sometimes really hard public affairs. Political life is never as big as the subject matter. <laughs> and, you know, ministers come and go. Uh, I was there at the behest and the prerogative of the prime minister. And uh, when... He says, you've got to go, you've got to go. That's the way life is. And, um, you know, when an officer is told you're not going any further forward in terms of promotion, he puts his hand up and says, who wants to employ me? Yeah. And uh, I think that just it's, it's just uh, one of the risk factors in the business. Politics is an extraordinarily unstable business. And you, you go into it with your eyes wide open, you know. Um, you know I've done almost 50 jury trials and several murders over the years as a lawyer. When the verdict comes down, guilty, not guilty, you just cop it sweet. Right. And uh, accordingly, professionalism must rule the day. Yes. But I'd like to think that I had the national interest at heart at every turn of every corner. And I have an opinion. Now, my opinion often disagreed with people. And when those people are much more important than me, there's only one way out. <laughs> David, I hope this series is going to almost act as a bit of a primer for people that might aspire to the Defence sure. Minister's job and for those that, that work to Defence Ministers. What advice would you give um, in closing to someone who was perhaps about to start the challenge of being Australia's Minister for Defence? Well, be a reformist, but never be bigger than the game itself. Take advice, digest that advice, and be prepared to, to cop it sweet when your time is up. David, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. Pleasure. <laughs>